Hey everybody and welcome to How-To Videos with Dr. Amy Gates. This video is part of the Massively Open Online Video Style Textbook for Introduction to Statistics. For more information or to find other resources, check out mathandstatistics.com. This video is going to focus on the different sampling methods that can be used, research design such as experimental and observational, as well as some examples in Excel to see these sampling methods in action. So before we get started with the sampling methods, I want to review sample versus population. Remember that a sample is a collection or a subset, a much smaller group, that is taken from your population of interest. And your population of interest is completely dependent on the research that you or your group are performing. In general, a population would be considered all possible people or items or objects of interest, again, for the given research that you're looking at. So when you do research or when you're part of a research group, you would define your population of interest, and then from that population, you would collect a sample. So, for example, suppose research is being completed on the use of vitamin C for reducing symptoms of the common cold. Well, in that case, the population is all people who can get the common cold, and that's basically all of us. So that's a huge population of over 7 billion, and so a sample taken from that population is going to be a smaller collection or group of people who can get the common cold. In the second example, suppose you're a veterinarian who wants to determine um, a new medication for dogs who suffer from hip issues or hip dysfunctions. Well, in this case, your population of interest is actually all dogs who have problems with their hips. And so when you take a sample, your sample is going to come from that particular population and will be a smaller collection containing dogs who have hip problems. So as you can see, the population is defined by what research you're doing and is called your population of interest. It generally contains all possible people, items, elements, object, or whatnot that are of interest in your given research. And then a sample is a much smaller collection drawn from that population. Now when you take a sample, you have a lot of different options as to the method that you might want to use to collect your sample. Probably the easiest one to envision, but sometimes the most expensive one in reality, is a simple random sample. In this case, you're collecting your sample using a method that gives an equal chance of selecting any of the members of your entire population. So if we suppose that your population, for example, is every single person in the United States of America, let's say that's your population of interest, an easy way to randomly sample from that population is to randomly generate social security numbers and then use those numbers to randomly then select members from that population. Now, random sampling is great if you're eliminating bias completely, if you don't want to affect your sample in any way, but it's not good for situations um, when it's not so easy to collect data or collect a sample using that method. It's also uh, expensive. For example, you might grab a random sample of social security numbers, but those people may not want to participate in your study, and you certainly can't force them to. So random sampling is exactly what it sounds like. You randomly select values, and it's good for some cases, and it's not as good for other cases. An example, again, where random sampling may not be your best bet is suppose you are specifically trying to create a sample that contains a fair distribution of certain attributes, like gender, for example. Suppose you want to make sure that your sample is 50% male and 50% female. In that case, random sampling might not give you that result. So that's something else to think about. The second type of sampling that we're going to talk about is called systematic sampling. Systematic sampling is a little bit easier than random sampling and also has its pluses and minuses. So let's say you have 100,000 people that you could choose, but that's just too large for your sample. A systematic way of grabbing people from this collection 
and still trying to make it random is you could choose, say, every 45th person. That's systematic because it's a system. You're going to choose the first person and then the, the next 45th person and then the next 45th person and so on in a systematic way. So whenever you grab your sample using some kind of pre pre-described system, it's called systematic. Systematic gives you an element of randomness, but it also has the same minuses that random sampling may have, such as it doesn't allow you to control the nature of your sampling, like having an equal percentage of male and female, or managing the different age groups in your sample, and so on. So those are the first two. The next one is called a convenience sample. This is in fact used very often because as you can imagine, collecting samples is not simple. Many people don't want to be part of research. Going out and randomly sampling can be very costly and time consuming. And many businesses don't have either the time or the money and they're really just looking to get an idea of what the population has in mind. And so they tend to use something called a convenience sample, which means they just select their sample based on its availability and its accessibility. So for example, let's say you wanted information about college students who maybe have math phobia. You could just go right into your department, put up a sign on the wall that says, I'm conducting a study. I am looking for 100 volunteers who have math phobia and let your sample group come to you. That's both convenient and available. However, it is most certainly not random or systematic at all. The next type of sampling method is called a cluster sample. Clustering is also a method for reducing your cost but still trying to retain an element of randomness to your sample. Clustering is generally used when you have a very, very big group and your group is very similar overall. And so what you can do is you can just cluster your group into a bunch of subgroups, randomly select a couple of the subgroups, and then use all of the elements in those two or three subgroups that you've collected. And I'm gonna show an example of this in Excel to allow this to make a little bit more sense, seeing it in action. But here's an example here that we'll look at briefly. Let's say you have a large classroom of students, and overall your students are generally the same. Their ages are very similar. You know you have half male and half female, and you're not particularly worried about evening out genders or anything like that. What you can do is you can cluster your classroom into six random groups, and then of those groups, you can randomly choose two of them and use those two clusters to create your sample. So it creates an element of randomness, but it's not fully. And again, clustering works well when the larger group that you're breaking into smaller clusters is kind of homologous. It's generally the same. In many cases, however, you don't want to break your group down into similar groups. You actually want to make sure that your sample ends up giving you a very fair estimate of the larger population. In other words, you want the same amount of males and females. Maybe you want to make sure that you're representing all the age groups. Maybe you want to make sure that you're representing smokers and non-smokers, and so on and so forth. So another method of sampling is called stratified sampling. In this case, you think about your population and how it might actually separate into strata or subgroups. And there's so many different ways to separate. You can separate by gender, you can separate by age, you can separate by state. Some people live in Florida, some people live in California. You can separate by income, you can separate by religion. However you want to separate your population. Once you have it separated into strata, then you can gather elements randomly from each strata, and that's the key. By gathering randomly from each strata, you guarantee that your final sample is going to have a little bit from each group, so a little, a little bit from each age group, or making sure you have both male and female, or making sure you're representing all different income levels, and so on. 
So most people find that stratified sampling and cluster sampling get a little confusing. And here's the key difference. In a cluster sample, your population is largely the same and you're just grouping them so that you can reduce the size of your overall sample by then randomly grabbing a couple of those clusters. In a stratified sampling, you're actually specifically separating your population into subgroups that are different, different age groups, different genders, different socioeconomic backgrounds. And then from those subgroups, you are randomly selecting some of those elements. So it's actually quite different than, than clustering. Now let's take a quick look at an Excel spreadsheet with a data set and think about how each one of these sampling methods might look. Now this data set is itself a sample, but you can always take a sample from a sample that you already have. And so what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna assume that this is data that we have and how would we grab a smaller subset or a sample from this data? The first type of sampling method that we used was called simple random sampling. So I could literally with my mouse say, okay, I wanna use that student, that student, that student, that student, that student. I could also use Excel's method for random sampling. I know that I have uh, students between A2 all the way down to A31. And so Excel offers an option for generating a random value. If you type in equals and start with the letter R, it will bring up rand, which gives you a random number between zero and one, or rand between, which allows you to choose your bottom and your top value. So I could actually say, give me a random number between two, because that's where my first student is, and 31, which is where my last student is. Two to 31, parenthesis, press enter, and it just randomly chose 22. That means that in my final sample, I'm going to use this particular element. And then I can repeat this as many times as I want. In fact, I can click here, here's my formula, I can highlight it with the mouse. I can use Control C to copy it. I can press Enter. And then I can click in the blank, anywhere blank really, press Control V, and it will copy that same formula and generate another random value. And I can keep pressing Control V is all I'm doing. I'm continuously saying to Excel, give me a random value between two and 31 until I have as many as I want. So here's a set of randomly generated numbers between two and 31. And so if I needed a sample of size seven, now I have one. I need to grab student, the student in 18, that's that student. I need to grab the student in 24, so that's down here. I need to grab the student, I got another 18, because remember this is random, so you can have repeats. And then it's up to you if you wanna use that repeat or not. So Excel gives you options for uh, random sampling in itself. Now the next type of sampling that we were looking at, aside from random sampling, was the idea of separating into clusters and then just using all the elements in those clusters. So let's assume for a moment that all the students in this class, though they do have differences, Overall, we're gonna say that there are one collection of students, one group. I don't wanna randomly sample because it's annoying or I don't have time or whatnot. So I'm just gonna create these clusters. I'm gonna copy this first cluster over here. And I'm gonna grab the second cluster and I'm gonna copy it over here. I'm gonna scroll down and grab this other cluster and I copy it over here and so on. So these are just clusters. They're just collecting the students into groups. Now, I don't need a large sample, I just want a small sample, so I'm gonna randomly select that cluster, and that's gonna be my sample. Also, if I wish, I can randomly select both of those clusters, and that's going to be my sample. So the idea behind clustering is you're not trying to 
subcategorize your group. You're just throwing them into clusters and then randomly grabbing one or more of those clusters. It's like a pseudo-random sampling. Now what about stratified? What would that look like? In the case of stratified, I might be interested in making sure that I'm collecting some first-year students, some seniors, some juniors, and some sophomores into my sample. I want to make sure I have a little bit of everybody. So what I like to do is I'm going to copy this whole column by highlighting the H because that's where the column is and choosing control C. And then I'm just going to highlight the K and put a copy of it over here. Now I'm going to, let's say I'm curious about the student heights along with this. So I'm going to go ahead and choose height, control C, control V. Okay, now I can use Excel to place this in order. So I'm going to highlight both columns. I'm going on data up at the top. And then I'm going to sort this from A to Z. And by doing that, you'll see that it's going to put my students in order. All the first years are now in one strata. All the juniors are now in their own strata. The seniors are in their own strata. And the sophomores are in their own strata. Now I can randomly grab a few from each of the stratas. And this will assure that my final sample has a little bit of each of these groups. That's what stratified sampling looks like. So now here's my final sample right here. And you can see that I have a little bit of each type of group in this case. So very different than cluster sampling because in stratified sampling I want to separate my group or my population in this case into subgroups and then I want to randomly grab out of each subgroup so that my final sample has a little bit of everybody in it. Everybody's represented. So those are the main differences between the different sampling methods and there's certainly overlap between all the sampling methods. In many cases the type of sampling that is performed is largely dependent on the accessibility, the type of research you're doing, the funding, the amount of time you have, and so on. Finally, as the last part of this video, we're going to look at two different uh, designs for research. The two major research design methods are observational and experimental. Now, an experimental study is a study that involves research that directly affects the members in your research sample, generally with some kind of treatment. And then that effect is evaluated, results are generated and further analyzed. But the key to an experimental study is that the researcher or researchers are directly affecting the members of their sample, generally with some kind of treatment. As an example, let's say you have two groups of people. You've got a large sample that you've split into two separate groups. Both groups have the same environment and diet, but one of the groups you're going to give a thousand milligrams of vitamin C to each day. The other group you're not going to do that. So you have a control group in this experiment and you have the group where you're affecting with a treatment of a thousand milligrams of vitamin C per day. After six months, each group can be compared for things like common cold, symptoms, duration, incident, and so on. This is an experimental study where you're directly controlling and affecting your groups. An observational study is very different. In an observational study, you only observe and collect data. You do not influence or modify or affect any of the members of the sample or what is being studied. You can take measurements, like you can measure somebody's uh, BMI or their height. You can even take blood samples as long as it's a measurement. But you cannot affect them with a treatment. And so an example of this would be a group of people who identify themselves as already using vitamin C can answer questions on a survey about the number of colds they get per year, other health issues. So you're not giving them the vitamin, they're taking it on their own, and you're simply asking them questions. You are the observer only. So these are the two major types of statistical studies. 
So I hope this overview of sampling methods and statistical studies has helped. Join me for our next part of the MOOC. Thank you.